started saying President Trump's senior advisor and former longtime campaign manager Brad Parscale tackled in front of his home after a standoff with police, his wife telling them he hit her. I didn't, I didn't do anything. President on damage control following that bombshell New York Times report finding President Trump paid just $750 in federal income taxes when he took office and reportedly not paying any taxes for 10 out of 15 years, clobbering his image as a successful businessman. The report shows Trump appears to be hundreds of millions of dollars in debt. The president dismissing the report, claiming he has very little debt and was entitled to tax credits. Less than 24 hours until the main event, the first presidential debate between Trump and Biden. So many issues to dig into, how the candidates have been preparing, and how their campaigns are positioned heading into October. An alarming rise in COVID cases across the country, an increase in 33 states. New York State reporting its highest infection rate since mid-July. New York City schools resuming some in-class learning tomorrow. Florida is now allowing restaurants and bars back to 100% capacity. Dr. Anthony Fauci with a warning, saying we are seeing tens of thousands of more daily cases than we should right now. Emergency wildfire evacuations in California. Two new major fires erupted. One destroying more than 11,000 acres at a hospital forced to transfer its patients. Battleground push. We are on the ground in Michigan to find out what's on voters' minds in that crucial swing state. And before you pop that cork or twist that top, why manufacturing makeshift hand sanitizer is a sign of trouble for the wine industry. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with that bombshell reporting from the New York Times, offering a glimpse into the taxes of the only president in modern history who has not publicly released them. Those tax forms apparently show a president who paid just $750 in federal taxes the year he was elected president and in his first year in office. That's the same amount that someone who makes roughly $20,000 a year would pay. In at least 10 other years, the president paid no taxes at all. The reporting from the Times also paints a picture of a president elected on his image as a wealthy and successful businessman, but whose records show he's actually hundreds of millions of dollars in debt. The president offered differing lines of defense, blending denials with justifications, and we are, of course, just one night away from the first presidential debate where there is, this is sure to be a major issue. On this busy Monday, our Jonathan Carl leads us off from Cleveland. On the eve of the first presidential debate, the American public is getting what's been described as the first detailed look at one of Donald Trump's most closely guarded secrets, his tax returns. In its blockbuster report, the New York Times reviewed detailed information on nearly two decades worth of Trump tax returns. The details are startling. Trump paid no federal income taxes at all in 11 of the 18 years they reviewed. In 2016, the year he won the White House, Trump reportedly paid only $750. For his first year in office, he again paid just $750. $750 is roughly the federal income tax bill of someone who makes $20,000 a year. At the White House, the president insisted the Times report was not accurate. Well, first of all, I paid a lot, and I paid a lot of state income taxes, too. But state and federal income taxes are two different things. The president built his brand and his campaign on being a business genius with a Midas touch. I have great business sense. I made a lot of money and I had great success. So I've had great success. By the way, really successful. But the Times reports the Trump businesses, including his golf courses and resorts, are actually a wash in red ink. His Washington hotel reportedly lost $55.5 million since it opened four years ago. His foreign ventures, according to the Times, are among the few that have actually made money since he became president, more than $73 million, some of the most profitable in countries with authoritarian leaders, including the Philippines and Turkey. When Trump ran for president the first time, he insisted he was loaded with money and had almost no debt whatsoever. Yeah, you know, it's very interesting. I'm so liquid, I don't need debt, and if I need... But the Times reports the president is actually drowning in debt, including more than $421 million that could come due over the next four years. The paper noting that if Trump is re-elected, quote, his lenders could be placed in the unprecedented position of weighing whether to foreclose on a sitting president. Today, the president tweeted he has very little debt compared to the value of assets.
He has repeatedly said his tax returns are under IRS audit. It's under audit, and they've been under audit for a long time. The IRS does not treat me well. The newspaper reports the IRS is in fact investigating a $72.9 million tax refund the president received in 2010 and whether he took improper deductions. The Times found Trump took tax deductions for money spent on his lavish lifestyle, including $70,000 on hairdressers during his time on The Apprentice and more than $95,000 for Ivanka Trump's makeup artist. The president says he is entitled, like everyone else, to depreciation and tax credits. He has long refused to turn over his tax returns, but he's also bragged about his ability to avoid paying taxes. The only years that anybody's ever seen were a couple of years when he had to turn them over to state authorities when he was trying to get a casino license, and they showed he didn't pay any federal income tax. So that makes if me he's smart. paid zero, that means zero for troops. The Biden campaign points out that most voters do pay taxes, releasing an ad today highlighting working class people who have paid more federal income tax than the self-described billionaire in the White House. And this may certainly raise some eyebrows, in particular for those working class Americans. Jonathan Carl joins us now. John, I know that you've certainly pressed the president and the White House for years about his tax returns. We saw his defense today. Is this reporting from the Times something that you think that the president and his supporters will simply try to brush off? Well, certainly the president's going to try to brush it off. I've talked to people in his inner circle who are working on preparing for the debate tomorrow night, and they say that essentially what he will say is not much different than what he said uh, to Hillary Clinton, which is, I'm a really smart guy. I'm a business guy. I, I'm going to pay as little as I possibly can in my businesses and taxes. That's just the way I do it. Uh, the problem, if there is a problem, is with the tax code, not with what I did. Uh, whether or not that plays with his supporters, I, I assume, you know, It'll play well with the with many of the supporters who have put up with a lot. But this does get to be something that is uh, something that people can really understand. That seven hundred and fifty dollars uh, is quite a number for somebody who has described himself uh, as a multi billionaire uh, to pay in taxes. And, and of course, the Biden campaign is clearly hoping that this resonates with some of those undecided voters. What's your sense of how this will play in the coming days, especially in that critical first debate tomorrow night? Well, you have an indication today with the Biden campaign putting out what they're calling their tax calculator, where anybody can go in, type in your income, uh, calculate how much you would pay in federal income taxes, and then compare it to how much Donald Trump paid. Biden and his campaign clearly believe that this is an issue that resonates. It's an issue that hits home. It's an issue of fundamental fairness. And I expect it will be one that he hits very hard tomorrow night at the debate here in Cleveland. We will be paying close attention. All right, Jonathan Carl reporting in yes. for us from Cleveland. And this bombshell report is dropping as both Biden and Trump prepare for their first debate showdown tomorrow night in Cleveland. ABC's Terry Moran joins us now. Terry, set the stakes for us for this face-off. What are the rules and, and what should we expect? Well, the stakes, Lindsay, are very high. This is really the first chance that voters have to take a good look, to eyeball both men at length and under pressure. Some polls suggest that up to 70% of Americans say they want to watch this debate. There'll be tens of millions around the world as well. And it will be a debate unlike any other because of the coronavirus pandemic. There's going to be no handshake, which may be a good thing, given uh, the way these two have been going at each other. And they'll be at opposite ends of the stage. They've agreed that neither one will wear a mask, uh, either to try to show up or, or make a point. Masks are out once they get to the stage. Uh, and then the moderator, Chris Wallace, has laid out a pretty meaty debate. Six topics, each one for 15 minutes, uh, beginning with uh, the Trump and Biden records, and then the coronavirus pandemic, the economy, race and violence in our cities, uh, and the integrity of the election as well. The Supreme Court is in there, too. So it should be a meaty debate, but I think people are looking to see if they can answer questions about both men. Uh, uh, you know, President Trump, uh, is he under control? I think he's, he's had some rough weeks recently. Joe Biden, is he strong enough? The, the questions about his age. Uh, and these are questions that people around the country have. We went to Michigan recently to s take the temperature of voters there. Uh, this was a state that Donald Trump won in 2016. He's behind now. But we listened to the people, and it does look like Biden has a shot. Here we go. 
Michigan, the state that shocked the Democrats in 2016, a prime target for both candidates this time. It's great to be here in Michigan and, uh, and uh, with the uh, United Auto Workers. For decades, the Wolverine state helped propel Democrats into the White House, but Donald Trump cracked this part of the blue wall wide open, and he hopes to take it again. On November 3rd, Michigan, you better vote for me. I got you so many damn car plants. Before Trump, Ronald Reagan was the last Republican to win here way back in 1984. A key question this year, will those Trump converts stick with him? Chris Vitale in Macomb County told us he will. I'm definitely more enthusiastic. Uh, initially, he was still a candidate. He was unproven. Uh, this go around, I'll have seen four years of track record of him at least trying to get the job done. Trump is trailing Biden in Michigan. The Supreme Court nomination of Judge Amy Coney Barrett hasn't seemed to change the race much, but many voters, including Chris, don't like the hardball politics of it all. Ideally, it would be best to have the confirmation after the election, just so that the there isn't any problems with the legitimacy of the way it's looked at by the rest of the country. But uh, I would accept either. But the president going full steam ahead. This should be a straightforward and prompt confirmation should be very easy. I think what we're seeing is the ultimate level of hypocrisy coming from a president. Senate Republicans are doing everything they can, including the White House, to see if they can rush a Supreme Court justice down the throats of the American people. Reverend Charles Williams II in Detroit says the Supreme Court fight and broader issues of racial justice require a much more energized Biden campaign. You need to see Joe Biden on the front lines of a protest. You need to see Kamala Harris on the front lines of a protest. You need to see Joe Biden and Kamala Harris passing out masks, serving people food. This is a urgent time in America right now, and merely talking about it is not enough. Half an hour away in Roseville, sisters Leslie Hall and Carmen Dickerson also believe more action than talking is needed. The same people who are out marching and protesting and whatever they're doing, I hope and pray that they are using that same amount of energy to get their community, their friends, their family, everybody out to the poll because it's important. That's where the change happens. The sisters run their own bakery, which took a hit during the pandemic. They're backing Biden to lead the recovery, and they question the president's business expertise. He says he's the business president. Do you feel that he's better for your business? I don't think so. I don't think he's really compassionate about the smaller businesses. I think that when it comes to the things that he's doing, it only affects the larger companies. I would agree with her 100%. Just, you know, first of all, you can't call yourself a business president if you didn't successfully run your own. The other big issue, the pandemic. Some Trump supporters, like Rebecca Gregory, who's a nurse, cut him some slack. How is Trump done on the pandemic? You know, I tell everyone, I don't care what side they're on, I blame no one for making mistakes during the pandemic. It's new. I think overall, he's done the best he can with it. Mistakes were made on either side. Trump kind of downplays masks. He says, well, he doesn't like to wear one. Isn't he failing on that for you as a healthcare worker? No. Why not? I think his main focus is trying not to alarm the public. Masks are great, masks work. Washing your hands works better. Covering your cough, but people don't do that. So yeah, let's wear the masks. Almost four years ago, I came to Michigan after that stunning election. So we want to find out what the people of Macomb County feel as the inauguration arrives. You could feel the enthusiasm, the optimism among Trump supporters back then. So I think we need someone who's going to find that middle ground for all of those people and give us some hope for the next four years. One of them, Kim Newman Rice. And you feel the same way now? I think his overall leadership has been good. I think that he's put a lot of good policies in place that are in line with, you know, my family values. So last time around, he was the outsider charging into Washington. Now he's, he's been in charge. And it's kind of a performance review. I just think we're, we're in a weird climate. You know, pandemic, racial divide, and then an election. And it's just a trifecta of, 
ugly that makes it even more difficult for him to have a good performance review. Even with all the struggles through the pandemic, he's created jobs, he's created opportunity, um, you know, he's gotten people back to work. Um, I think that if you look at the bigger picture, and I just hope that people don't focus on 2020 alone. I think you have to look at the big picture before you make those types of decisions. But other 2016 Trump supporters are switching sides. It didn't take long for me to really have uh, severe buyer's remorse. Mayor Michael Taylor of Sterling Heights is a Republican, but after backing Trump in 2016... Who are you supporting this time around? Joe Biden. Joe Biden will be the first Democratic presidential candidate that I voted for in my life. Mayor Taylor says Trump lost his vote on character more than anything, but he knows his constituents and why they went with Trump four years ago and may again. I don't think that Trump's voters are all racist. I don't think that Trump's voters are all sexist. I don't think Trump's voters are all just uneducated people. I think they're people who just have had enough of being told that they're not good enough. He says the race is as tight here as it was in 2016, but but Biden has a real shot. Joe Biden is a different candidate than Hillary Clinton was, and he doesn't need to peel off a whole lot of voters here. He just needs a very small percentage. He's been there for working class people for 40 years, and uh, he's not somebody that's going to lie to you. Our thanks to Terry for that in-depth report. And be sure to check out the newest show here on ABC News Live, hosted by Terry and Diane Macedo. Your voice, your vote, The Breakdown. It airs right after this show. But tomorrow, be sure to stay with us for that crucial first debate tomorrow night. There will be a special edition of 2020 starting at 8 Eastern, followed by the debate at 9 o'clock right here on ABC News Live. And turning now to the coronavirus crisis, as we approach 1 million global COVID deaths, nearly 205 thousand lives have been lost here in the U.S. And we're seeing more than 40,000 new cases reported in this country every day, a number that health officials are concerned is not sustainable heading into the cold weather months if we have any chance of keeping the virus under control. In Florida, where bars and restaurants have been crowded after restrictions were lifted, hospitals are hopeful but bracing for impact. Our Victor Kendo has the latest from Miami tonight. In Florida, crowds are again packing restaurants and bars after the governor gave the green light to fully reopen. It honestly looks like it's business as usual. It looks like how it was pre-COVID era. After first reopening in May, Florida became the epicenter of the virus. So far, losing more than 14,000 lives. Cases are now rising in 33 states and Puerto Rico. Dr. Anthony Fauci telling GMA he's concerned about the level of infection. We're not in a good place with regard to what I had said back then because as we get into the fall and the winter, you really want the level of community spread to be as low as you possibly get it. And I hope not, but we very well might start seeing increases in deaths. New York sounding the alarm after topping more than a thousand cases for the first time since June. It comes as thousands more students go back to New York City classrooms and limited indoor dining reopens. Today, President Trump announcing 150 million rapid tests are on their way to the states. The vice president today with this blunt warning. The American people uh, should anticipate that, that cases will rise in the days ahead. But moments later, the president once again claiming we are rounding the corner on the virus. We're rounding the corner and uh, very importantly, vaccines are coming, but we're rounding the corner regardless. But vaccines are coming and they're coming fast. Nearly 205,000 Americans have lost their lives to COVID-19. Just weeks after teacher Demetria Bannister passed away at 28 years old, the virus claiming her mother's life. 57-year-old Shirley, a nursing teacher who learned she had COVID the day she lost her daughter. What has this been like for your family after losing both your aunt and your cousin? It definitely um, leaves a void within each and every one of us, I think. Um, sometimes we think that they went somewhere and, you know, they'll be back. But then reality will sink in and uh, we realize that their destination has no return. Some heart-wrenching accounts to be sure for those who have lost loved ones. Our thanks to Victor for that report. The lone Kentucky officer charged in connection with the fatal shooting of Breonna Taylor entered a plea today. This is we're seeing new body cam video first obtained by Vice from the night of her death as calls grow louder for officials to release the grand jury transcripts. Pierre Thomas has more.
Today, new video surfacing in the tragic death of Breonna Taylor. Vice News says this is police body camera footage from just after the shooting. In it, you can see a police dog barking and officers yelling commands as Taylor's boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, is arrested. Walk back, I'll send this dog! Vice News says this second clip shows Brett Hankison in the apartment. ABC News has not independently verified the identity of the officers in the video. Hankison appears to ask about shell cases, but the other officer advises him... Well, I'd, I'd back out until they get PIU in here. Today, Hankison arraigned in court on three counts of first-degree wanton endangerment, not in Taylor's death, but in bullets that hit a neighbor's home. How does Mr. Hankison plead? He pleads not guilty to each count. Through his attorney, Walker, who has admitted to firing a warning shot that night, now raising questions about whether Hankison may have fired the shot injuring one of the officers. The new accusation appears to contradict Kentucky Attorney General Daniel Cameron. Kenneth Walker fired the shot that hit Sergeant Mattingly. But part of a state ballistics report provided to ABC News says one of the bullets recovered at the scene, which may have hit Mattingly, has been neither identified nor eliminated from having been fired from Walker's gun. Walker's attorneys claim that Hankison had access to a handgun the same caliber as Walker. Lizzie Cameron has not responded to the accusations and so far has refused to release a related FBI ballistics report. Walker's attorneys have filed a motion to have the grand jury transcript released. Lindsay? Pierre, our thanks to you. And now to the fires in the West that have taken aim at the heart of California's wine country, destroying multiple structures and threatening wineries as it ballooned. Tens of thousands have now been forced from their homes. Kana Whitworth has the harrowing images. Tonight, homes engulfed and more families told to get out as multiple out of control wildfires rage north of San Francisco. The fires more than quadrupling in size in just 12 hours. This glass fire sparked two other fires nearby. So as you can see here in Napa Valley, we are essentially surrounded by flames. Sirens blaring, families racing to evacuate. We left with nothing. I mean, just literally with nothing. We're so lucky to be alive. In Santa Rosa, city buses lining up overnight to take more than 100 senior home residents out of harm's way, some still in their pajamas. St. Helena's Hospital forced to evacuate for a second time in a month. We're very thankful that uh, the hospital, at least right now, is still standing. And tonight, images of the burned out neighborhoods that firefighters couldn't save. Now, Lindsay, you can see behind me some of this extreme prior danger that they're dealing with. In fact, this tree is burned all the way up to the top since I've been standing here. So that's a concern that these trees will fall. You can see the smoke kind of swirling back there and trees are popping. Oh, another branch just fell back there. Uh, power lines can come down. So this is a high concern for firefighters. Now the wind is expected to die down, but these red flag warnings remain in effect. And in fact, they extend south into Los Angeles through tomorrow. So we have a critical 24 hours ahead. Lindsay. Really some incredible images there, Kana. Stay safe. And when we come back, the wine growers struggling to hold on, sales down, turning their prized possessions into hand sanitizers. What does this mean for the future of the wine industry? The alleged kidnapping plot thwarted by Joe Montana and his wife, how someone tried to take their grandchild from their Malibu home. And authorities now working to disinfect a water system after a rare brain-eating amoeba killed a six-year-old. The anticipation, the expectations, the stakes couldn't be higher. Trump Biden, debate one, Tuesday night on ABC, starting with a live event special with the most powerful team in politics. Then the debate, Tuesday night on ABC. <laughs> when your animal is in trouble, you need someone incredible. Who's next? When your favorite pet needs a trip to the vet, yeah, you girl. need someone incredible and knowledgeable and respectable. We need a Dr. Paul. Thank you. The Incredible Dr. Paul. New episode Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. Hello? This is Montana Highway Patrol. And you're looking for a couple of missing teenagers. That's right. When the night Last scene in a red focus. Has come. The steering wheel is getting stiff. Lock the door. We're fine. 
got ourselves a predicament. When the night has come. Now could be a good time to have another baby. Are you crazy? I'm in love with you. Now that I said it out loud, it does sound weird. <laughs> I feel so Please stop. When I see you were so fine, I had to remind myself to breathe. I feel something when I see you. Let's do this. How's your quarantine going? <sighs> Right now, at this defining moment in America, with so much on the line. From ABC News, a groundbreaking month-long event every right. night taking on this moment right. for America. Turning Point, the we Nightline event, right. late night on ABC. Welcome back. Earlier, you heard about the threat facing many top wine growers in California as those wildfires continue to scorch the region. In Europe, wine growers have been facing different struggles. Reduced consumption from the pandemic and the need for more hand sanitizer has dramatically altered vineyards in places like France and Italy, as our Maggie Ruley explains. It's something French wine grower Cyril Picard would have never imagined just months ago. Turning his crop, his pride. Super. Super millésime. From this to pure, clear alcohol. And not the kind you drink, the one you use to disinfect your hands. It was an emergency method. We didn't have the choice. We had to understand the situation and make a decision. Back in spring, there was a global shortage of hand sanitizer. So the French government got creative and they turned to their wine growers for help. Everything happened quickly and in a matter of weeks we were able to send thousands of gallons of French wine to the distillery. The distillery is where thousands of gallons of ready-to-drink wine was sent to be processed into this clear liquid. When this is all over, the alcohol here will be put in tanks and will be sent to other industrial or pharmaceutical groups uh, to be transformed into hand sanitizer. It sounds devastating, turning renowned French wine into a sterile product. But Surreal didn't see it that way. He saw it as something that could benefit his business and his country. The French government set aside 250 million euros to ensure the wineries, a source of French national pride, survived. We did our duty. But perhaps more importantly, shipping off last year's product meant there was now room for this year's exceptional harvest. The vine this year was generous. It left us a lot of grapes. We didn't even need to triage them. 100% of the grapes were perfect. We've rarely had wines that only after five, six days of fermentation tasted this magnificent. This is very promising. It's a dilemma a lot of wine growers dealt with during lockdown. All the fun, fancy alcohol just sitting in these caves. No more uh, weddings, no more people uh, meeting, and so it, it stopped the uh, consumption of champagne in France and in the um, other country too. Champagne maker Cyril Genot Rabom says some in the region had to resort to sadder means to prevent overcrowding, dumping their crop to rot and fertilize the soil. Cyril decided to harvest all of his crop, but his sales have already dropped 30% this year. We will keep perhaps 15,000 bottles in the cellar, uh, which normally uh, would be uh, sold. But it's not all doom and gloom. Like any fine wine, his is only going to get better with age. They are here, they wait slowly. Take, take times. It, it gives more and more flavors. It's not a problem for the wine. Um, it's better and better. So um, it's not a problem to wait for the wine. For the economy, it's uh, another, <laughs> another thing. In Ischia, an island just off the coast of Naples, Italy, Sarah D'Ambro whips through her family's vineyard in her hot pink Vespa. Generations of winemakers pouring their soul into this volcanic hillside. She tells us that this year, the vineyard sales during March and April were zero. We thought it was going very bad. Though. But as customers came out of lockdown, business bounced back. All the summer time, was, uh, uh, all the selling uh, went very fast. Likely, we sold more than we thought. 
She had predicted a whopping 50% drop in sales. For now, it's only 20. Her product sitting in these steel containers, around one and a half million dollars worth of wine in them. Now they're banking on that uptick in sales from this summer to continue through the fall to get them through. We actually have no plan B, huh? so everything is going day by day. The global market was upended by the pandemic. Northern Italy is known for its premium grapes and wine, but under lockdown, no one was really celebrating. And it's these big, expensive vineyards that have been hit hard. And while it's hard to say when or if sales will go back to what they used to be, winemaker Marchese Giacomo Catenio Adorno says this season does bring some hope. He says he expects this harvest to make some of the best wine he's seen in decades. We had an incredible spring. The perfumes in the wines are absolutely incredible. Under lockdown, there was almost no travel and air pollution levels plummeted. The lack of pollution brought us a definite climate change, much stronger sun, much more light, and, this, and a very dry summer. An extraordinary harvest in the middle of hardship. Giacomo says it's not the first time something like this has happened. One of the best vintages in the whole of history was the year 1789, the year of the French Revolution. So, I mean, I think wine has an independent life uh, to historical events and uh, survives to, has survived to more difficult things. And while perhaps the world has little to toast right now, wine growers are hoping their 2020 vintage will make this year a little more bubbly. I'm particularly happy to have received this vintage. My heart rejoices knowing the beautiful wines will give the public this year. Maggie Bruley, ABC News, Genoa, Italy. We have to imagine the wine will become finer with time. Our thanks to Maggie for that. And still ahead here on Prime, the disturbing standoff and police takedown of President Trump's former campaign manager. His wife claims he hit her. Authorities have now ordered a psych evaluation. News on a cyber attack involving a massive hospital system. And on the heels of that bombshell New York Times report, we look at the variety of jobs that often result in more than $750 in paid taxes. But first, our tweet of the day. The sense Bureau announcing that despite a federal judge's ruling last week that the counting should continue through the end of the month, the agency is scheduled to stop counting on October 5th. Anticipation, the expectations, the stakes couldn't be higher. Trump Biden, debate one, Tuesday night on ABC, starting with a live event special with the most powerful team in politics. Then the debate, Tuesday night on ABC. Friday, two music superstars. Do what you can. John Bon Jovi and Jennifer Nettles in an unforgettable GMA concert. John Bon Jovi, Jennifer Nettles. Friday on Good Morning America's concert series, sponsored by CarMax. The team with the highest card total could be leaving with a hundred thousand dollars to shop. Bam, bam, bam. Till you drop. Oh, mommy down. <laughs> Leslie Jones host Supermarket Sweep premieres Sunday, October 18th on ABC. I'm very thankful that these men are fine. Tuesday, October 13th, we respect your wishes. The Bachelorette is back. This is the perfect place to fall in love. But respect the rumors. Do not ever talk to me like that. It's true. What? This is the most shocking season ever. That makes me sick. We. That's crazy. Do. <laughs> declare. Congratulations, you've just blown up The Bachelorette. The Bachelorette season premiere Tuesday, October 13th on ABC. Right now, at this defining moment in America. <laughs> So much on the line. We gonna be all right. We gonna be all right. From ABC News, Turning Point, the groundbreaking month-long event. Every night, taking over, taking on. This moment for America. My America, your America, our America. This is Turning Point, the nightline month-long event. We gonna be all right. Late night on ABC. 
Welcome back, everyone. The New York Times bombshell report on the president's tax returns is certainly dominating the headlines, with the paper reporting that the president paid just $750 in federal taxes in 2016 and 2017. So how does that compare to other Americans? Let's take a look by the numbers. How much the average American pays in taxes isn't easy to pin down, but for comparison, in 2016, households in the middle 20 percent of U.S. income paid an average of $2,200 in federal taxes, according to the Congressional Budget Office. That means those middle class households earning about $60,000 paid approximately three times as much in federal income taxes as Trump. Even taxpayers earning between twenty dollars to $25,000 a year paid about $1,100 in federal taxes in 2019, according to IRS data. According to the Tax Policy Center, some 44 percent of Americans pay no federal income tax, but most of those are low income Americans and seniors. And while some wealthy Americans do manage to pay no taxes through deductions and write offs, as the president has done, Trump's low tax bill isn't par for the course for the rich. According to the Associated Press, the average wealthy taxpayer in the top 0.001 percent paid about $25 million annually between 2000 to 2017. That's the same time frame when the New York Times said that the president paid on average $1.4 million in federal taxes after a massive refund now under audit by the IRS. And back to the 2020 race. Tax returns for Joe Biden show that he paid about $3.7 million in federal taxes in 2017 after leaving office. Expect the tax issue to be a major issue as the two face off tomorrow on the debate stage for the very first time. And we still have so much to get to here on Prime. The new report that says hundreds of thousands of sharks may be killed as COVID vaccine production ramps up. And our conversation with Maya Cummings, the widow of Maryland lawmaker Elijah Cummings, how she worked to finish his book and what he would think of this moment. But first, here's some of the trending stories on ABCnews.com. Anticipation, the expectations, the stakes couldn't be higher. Trump Biden, debate one, Tuesday night on ABC, starting with a live event special with the most powerful team in politics. Then the debate, Tuesday night on ABC. I'm very thankful that these men are fine. Tuesday, October 13th, we respect your wishes. The Bachelorette is back. This is the perfect place to fall in love. But respect the rumors. Do not ever talk to me like that. It's true. What? This is the most shocking season ever. That makes me sick. We. That's crazy. Do. <laughs> declare. Congratulations, you've just blown up The Bachelorette. The Bachelorette, season premiere Tuesday, October 13th on ABC. Hello? This is Montana Highway Patrol. You're looking for a couple of missing teenagers. That's right. When the night Last scene in a red focus. Has come. The steering wheel is getting stiff. Lock the door. We're fine. No, I won't be afraid. Be afraid. Be afraid. Got ourselves a predicament. When the night has come. Now could be a good time to have another baby. Are you crazy? I'm in love with you. Now that I said it out loud, it does sound weird. <laughs> I feel so Please stop. When I see you were so fine, I had to remind myself to breathe. I feel something when I see you. Let's do this. How's your quarantine going? <sighs> Right now, at this defining moment in America, with so much on the line. From ABC News, a groundbreaking month-long event every right. night taking on this moment right. for America. Turning Point, the we Nightline event. Right. Late night on ABC. Yesterday. Totally fake news. No, actually, I paid tax. Now, President Trump saying decades of his federal tax returns leaked to the New York Times indicate he benefited from tax credits and deductions that were legitimate. The Biden campaign already launching attack ads over the Times report, highlighting the thousands ordinary Americans pay in federal income taxes. He doesn't know how to debate the facts, but he's not that smart. 
According to the Times, President Trump paid no federal income taxes in 10 of the past 15 years, and in 2016 and 2017, paid only $750 to the IRS. I am looking very forward to the debate. No handshakes expected at the debate because of the pandemic. President Trump and Joe Biden preparing for tomorrow night's debate, their first head-to-head -head matchup. Joe Biden has taken time off from the campaign trail to prepare. He's been debating for 50 years. He knows how to do it the way he likes. President Trump, he's got a different approach. He says he takes questions all the time. He hasn't been doing much preparing. One of the country's largest health care providers reportedly hit by a massive cyber attack. Universal Health Systems confirms its IT network is down. The company operates some 400 hospitals and care centers across the U.S. and U.K. As for the millions of patients UHS accounts for, in a statement, the company says none of its patient data was accessed, copied, or compromised. Texas Governor Greg Abbott has issued a disaster declaration for Brazoria County. A six-year-old boy unknowingly played in contaminated water, caught a brain-eating amoeba, and died. Just days before he got sick, Josiah played in this splash pad in Lake Jackson. The amoeba also found in a hose at the boy's home. Experts say the amoeba, which is rare but almost always fatal, infects the body through the nose. Authorities are now working to flush and disinfect the water supply using chlorine, ordering all residents of Lake Jackson to boil the water before using. I just want my son back. Hall of Fame quarterback Joe Montana says that everyone is okay after a woman walked into his Malibu home and tried to kidnap his nine-month-old granddaughter. The Hall of Fame quarterback and his wife Jennifer were in their Malibu home on Saturday evening when the nightmare unfolded. According to the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, the child was asleep in a playpen in the family's living room when a 39-year-old woman entered the home and snatched the baby. Authorities say the couple confronted the woman, tried to de-escalate the situation, and asked for the suspect to give back their grandchild. A tussle ensued and Mrs. Montana was able to safely pry the child out of the suspect's arms. The suspect, identified as Sodzi Dolzell, fled the home. Montana flagged down deputies patrolling the area and the woman was taken into custody soon after, charged with kidnapping and burglary. Half a million sharks could be killed in order to save the world from the coronavirus. That warning from conservationists as sharks produce a potentially crucial vaccine ingredient. It's called squalene. That's a type of oil made in the liver. According to Sky News, it's used in vaccines to help create a stronger immune response. California-based group Shark Allies predicts 250,000 sharks will need to be slaughtered, twice that if the vaccine requires two shots. That's enough to make a last impact, so scientists are now testing alternatives, like using fermented sugar cane. You may already be familiar with squalene as it's used in cosmetics and machine oil. Nat Geo estimates 100 million sharks are killed every year, mostly for food. Welcome back. Next to the dramatic images coming out of South Florida. One of the top advisors to President Trump taken down by police after he barricaded himself in his home. As Rachel Scott reports, it all began after his wife called 911 to say he was armed. Okay, come out here. Tonight, alarming body cam video showing senior Trump campaign advisor and former campaign manager Brad Parscale tackled and taken down by Florida police. I didn't, do anything. I didn't do anything. His wife racing out of their home and calling 911. He went away and then I heard a loud boom. Telling police Parscale was intoxicated and armed. They went back inside, came back out of his office, like caught his handgun, okay, and went back inside. Got a lot of guns in the house? I think we had like four or five. Candace Parscale telling officers her husband had suicidal thoughts over the past few weeks. Police swarming the neighborhood, negotiating with him to surrender. Okay, all right, can you do us a favor? Can you walk out with no weapons, please? But most importantly, he's the best. It's a dramatic fall for the former campaign manager, who spoke to Leslie Stahl from 60 Minutes about being a newcomer and helping Trump win in 2016. Your wife has a wonderful expression about you being thrown into this. Yeah, she said that uh, I was thrown into the Super Bowl, never played a game and won. In 2018, he was put in charge of the president's re-election campaign, but he was demoted after disappointing turnout at a Tulsa rally in June and questions about misspending millions, leaving the campaign strapped for cash. Tonight, Parscale is hospitalized, undergoing a medical evaluation. The police report saying his wife had several bruises on her arms and scratches on her cheek and forehead. One officer saying she accused her husband of 
previously okay. hitting her. I didn't do anything. And our Rachel Scott joins us now. Rachel Parscala has been a close advisor to President Trump for quite some time now. What's the response from the president or the campaign? Yeah, well, when this first happened, the campaign initially came down and blamed Democrats for attacking uh, Parscale. But now they are stepping forward to say that their thoughts are with both him and his family as they wait for the facts to emerge. But there is no word tonight on if his role with the campaign is going to change. Lindsay. All right, Rachel Scott, thanks so much. Tonight, Elijah Cummings' widow is pressing forward to keep the message of her late husband alive. When we're dancing with the angels, the question will be asked, in 2019, what did we do to make sure we kept our democracy intact? Maya Cummings spent the better part of the last year getting Elijah Cummings' book, We Are Better Than This, over the finish line. She joins us now. Thank you so much, Maya, for your time. Thank you for having me, Lindsay. So first off, hats off for being able to deliver on uh, your husband's final political push posthumously. In reading the book, you can really hear his voice. You can hear him saying, we're better than this. And, and his sentiment of rooting for the underdog, which he ultimately describes democracy in this country as the underdog. Talk us through the goal of the book and also cementing his legacy. Right. So this book is about uh, life. It's about love. It's about health. Uh, it's certainly about death. And it's about what we actually owe to our country, the responsibility that we have to, uh, as Americans to the United States of America. Elijah felt so urgently about the need to warn people about the danger of Donald Trump. He, he, he felt very strongly that if Donald Trump managed to secure another term in office, we would no longer have a democracy. And that is why he spent literally a part of a significant part of the last year of his life working on this message to the American people. And you say that the book is his final warning to the American people about Donald Trump. We're now 36 days until the election. Your husband spent decades advocating for voting rights. Are you concerned about efforts by Donald Trump to try and delegitimize mail-in voting and also his refusal to commit to a peaceful transfer of power? Elijah would not have been surprised, and neither am I, about Donald Trump's behavior. Elijah took the measure of the man and found him sorely lacking. Uh, he viewed his character as being beneath what we de actually deserve and need as a country. Uh, and so with that, you know, he would have considered all of these efforts to actually delegitimize the election in advance, to actually prepare, create all these trial balloons to the American people that there will be a contested election. And even the effort around replacing Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, as a danger and a threat to democracy because what uh, the president seems to be doing is actually trying to game the Supreme Court uh, in anticipation of a contested election reaching that body. Uh, and so with that, you know, none of this was a surprise to Elijah. He would have uh, wholeheartedly, uh, you know, been out in the forefront making sure that people knew that this was a part of the nefarious strategy of our president and that we needed to stop him before he destroys our democracy completely. And your husband tried to reach across the aisle as much as he could. He talked about those uh, bipartisan efforts uh, in the book. As we enter an increasingly divisive time and prepare for a controversial Supreme Court nomination process, as you just mentioned, are you concerned and worried that old school bipartisanship may no longer be possible as it once existed? So Elijah was definitely worried, and so am I, that we have a partisan asymmetrical warfare happening, uh, with the Republican Party seeming to only care about holding on to power and not caring about patriotism, our Constitution, or our country. Uh, and he's calling on Republicans and Democrats and independents everywhere to not just find common ground, but to rise to higher ground, realizing that this is bigger than all of us. This is for our future. This is for our nation. This is for our children. Uh, and he would have encouraged Republicans, wh wherever they might be, who are having some form of cognitive dissonance, knowing that what the president's doing is not right, to actually step up and break ranks and uh, refuse to reelect this president or accommodate him. He deserves to be held accountable. The president is a con man.
Your husband tried to work with the president, uh, who you just uh, are calling a comment, but he wrote of, of pure pain that he felt after the president called Baltimore a disgusting rat and rodent infested mess, and how it cemented his belief that the president is racist. He also talks about the lies that President uh, Trump told him right to his face, including about prescription drug programs. He says in his book that he believed he was the first Democrat to meet with the president in the Oval Office one on one. How did he process all of this at the end of the day? I mean, in a personal sense, when he came t home to you after, for example, that first day at the White House with the president, what would he say? So actually, Elijah, you know, tried very hard to reach out uh, to actually form a personal relationship with uh, Donald Trump to actually get to know the man, uh, as he has done with Republicans, you know, since he's been in office. Uh, he's known for his bipartisanship, his ability to make friends across the aisle. So he tried to do the same thing with Donald Trump, despite what happened with the 2016 election. And he came away with a bitter taste in his mouth. While he initially thought the meeting went well, the fact that President Trump came out of that meeting and promptly lied about what he said deeply disturbed him. He really wanted to warn the people that, you know, he got to meet with him. He took the measure of the man. He found him lacking. And he wanted to make sure that the American people knew that he wasn't just not right for the job. He's an actual threat to our democracy. Maya Cummings, thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks for having me. And still to come here, power of the page, an unlikely moment in history igniting a whole new generation of readers. Kira Phillips brings us this remarkable tale you will not want to miss. Now it could be a good time to have another baby. Are you crazy? I'm in love with you. Now that I said it out loud, it does sound weird. <laughs> I feel so Please stop. When I see you were so fine, I had to remind myself to breathe. I feel when I see you. Let's do this. How's your quarantine going? <sighs> The team with the highest card total could be leaving Ooh. with a hundred thousand dollars. To shop. Bam. 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 Till you drop. Oh, mommy down. <laughs> Leslie Jones host, Supermarket Sweep. Premier Sunday, October 18th on ABC. I'm very thankful that these men are fine. Tuesday, October 13th. We respect your wishes. Let's begin. The Bachelorette is back. This is the perfect place to fall in love. But respect the rumors. Do not ever talk to me like that. It's true. What? This is the most shocking season ever. That makes me sick. We. That's crazy. Do. <laughs> declare. Congratulations, you've just blown up The Bachelorette. The Bachelorette, season premiere Tuesday, October 13th on ABC. Right now, at this defining moment in America. <laughs> So much on the line. We gonna be all right. We gonna be all right. From ABC News, Turning Point, the groundbreaking month-long event. Every night, taking over, taking on. This moment for America. My America, your America, our America. This is Turning Point, the nightline month-long event. We gonna be all right. Late night on ABC. Reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Premieres Thursday, October 6th, streaming on ABC News Live. Welcome to Disney Plus. Are you ready? Drop in and explore the action, the adventure, and the originals. There's no limit to what you'll find. These are your worlds. So come on, dive deeper into the universes you love, wherever and whenever you want them. You'll find them all here on Disney Plus.
Special delivery for actors Rooney, Mara, and Joaquin Phoenix, the Oscar-winning and nominated couple welcoming their first child together. The news came over the weekend when a director who worked with the couple mentioned it during a film festival Q&A. The director added that the baby's name is River, named, of course, after Joaquin's late brother actor River Phoenix, who passed away in 1993. Our congratulations to the new parents. And now to the couple on a mission to bring literature to a whole new generation of readers, all sparked by an unlikely page from history. Kira Phillips brings us the amazing story behind Liberation Station. Black women are fresh. Would you dad, must I pay for Like a summer breeze blowing The Miller the family's shore. life. That to be nothing but a perfect poem. There's something about the way they glow that catches my eyes. Or the debt to be poor. Like, like the rhythm of stanzas, their emotions that. rising and falling. Beneath these words like expressions in hard times that can't be heard. And good. Let me live onward. And I am able to once again admire your color of beauty. Every verse, every page takes you somewhere. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's everybody's story, though. Uh, it's really kind of like how you present it in terms of what your challenges are. You take what you experience and you learn to build from it. And I think we approach life and have always approached life uh, using commas, I think, for like the continuation of things. Like, we're going to keep going. We're going to do this. We're going to do Comma. this. Right. <laughs> College sweethearts with a passion for poetry and a love for literature took this family from food stamps to a fortuitous family business. Another speck floated. And it was all sparked by their nine-year-old son, Langston, and his hand-drawn vision of the perfect bookstore. This young writer, once breathed by Wally Mammoth, channeling his Harlem Renaissance poet namesake, Langston Hughes, he cried tears like one salty sea, decided he too would be an inspiring literary innovator. You and me. So Langston, why do you like to read so much? It helps me become a better person and influences me to make better choices. All of us, the stuff of stars. And what have you seen these books do for Langston? His yeah. concept of what is available to him has blown up exponentially. Yeah. His imagination is just unlimited. And coming to life, welcome to the fruits of Liberation Station. How sweet the sound. You, they'll want to post you up in a museum. That's my word. <laughs> Across Raleigh, North Carolina, these pop-up libraries have a specific purpose, solely providing children's literature in which main characters, heroes and heroines, are black. There's Harriet Tubman led hundreds of slaves. And if you can't stop for a free read, you can browse their online independent bookstore aka home warehouse we're giving you like the permission and the freedom to be liberated in yourself to accept your skin to accept your hair to take ownership of your body of all of your gifts because if you learn how to take care of something you end up ultimately like becoming a better human being because of it. A virtue Victoria learned decades ago, her past defining her present. And ironically, it would be a book that would determine her destiny. Struggle was something that defined Victoria's father's life too. A historical photographer, he wrestled with a drug addiction, pawning anything he could to support his habit, including a beautiful old Bible trimmed in gold, a Bible that held an unexpected treasure. My mom pregnant with my younger sister, Jessica, she said it, well, let me look through it. And she looked through it and she saw a collection of papers. And she said, well, you can pawn the Bible and I'll take the papers. Papers that turned out to be extraordinary pieces of history from the 1800s. Letters between abolitionist and author Frederick Douglass and a radical white bookstore owner from Baltimore. Original documents that the Millers discovered are worth millions of dollars. Do the two of you ever sit back and think, oh my gosh, your mom saved papers mm -hmm. about a white bookstore owner mm -hmm. talking to Frederick Douglass. You're running a bookstore mm -hmm. to empower people of color. Yeah. It's absolutely surreal because it's serendipitous is what it is. 
but the Miller's serendipitous surprise is not for sale. Under lock and key, the past will be preserved in an undisclosed location. This family maintaining their mantra that money will never mean more than their mission. What if those papers would have been sold? We would not have been able to affect generational change in people and children. Like what we're doing, what our bookstore does, it starts at the root of an issue and it nurtures the entire tree, the entire system. Choosing literature to assure their legacy. The caterpillars, the lions. Comma. I thank Yah for blessing me with the sight just to witness them smile. Continue. The progress of my character will liquidate all of the debts without injustice to higher claims. What a story. Our thanks to Kira for that. And before we go tonight, the image of the day. Take a look at this rock. A 102 carat D color flawless diamond. It's on display at an auction room in Hong Kong. It's the first time that a diamond this size is being auctioned off without reservations, meaning there's no limit. They will sell it for whatever the highest bid is. So perhaps I should get my bidding paddle ready. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us and good night.